welcome to the On the Top Coaching Podcast, where we discuss the new waves in the sport of swimming. I'm your host, Jason Polano, and with me today is athlete and coach performance consultant, Mark Hesse. Mark is one of the most dedicated collaborators in the coaching world, and I say collaborator, uh, but he's much more than that. He's one of the few coaches I know that creates and concedes more than he consumes. Uh, Mark has been a phenomenal mentor of mine, and I'm pumped to have him on the podcast. Mark, how are you today? I'm doing great, Jason. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, took us a while to get get uh, get all hooked up, but um, I'm glad to be on. The opportunity to share with you and the other coaches out there, and appreciate your kind words. Um, good thing I'm indoors because it's snowing here in Colorado Springs today on September whatever it is, September eighth. A little bit crazy turn in the weather here, but yep. And here it's all good. It's a balmy 93. So, <laughs> tale of two cities. Uh, Mark, right. I'm going to ask you the same question that every podcast asks every guest. Uh, what was your history in the sport? What got you into it? How did you make the transition to the coaching world? And what what does the last few years look like for you? Yeah. So, um, my uh, pretty humble career as a swimmer. Um, Started out like most kids in 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 rec league and uh, on a summer team, uh, kind of at a, a pool that my family belonged to, and I was basically a pool rat hanging out there all the time. Um, I think it the pool was part of a, a, a summer day camp, and uh, it opened every day at three, and I was there waiting at the gate at you know two fifty five for them to let us in to to use the pool uh, and then obviously got involved in, in swim team and loved it. And I had a great coach when I was, I think 11 or 12 and, and she uh, encouraged us. So her kids were on the team and she encouraged us um, uh, a bunch of us, uh, I guess the better kids at that point to, to try year round swimming, which was then AAU. Um, and so I tried out for the New England Barracudas and, uh, and I guess the rest is history, um, swam all the way up through, through high school, um, was never a, a real superstar, made, made a couple of finals at the New England high school championships, but never, never was up to the junior national level or anything like that. And then I did swim four years, uh, at Georgetown. Uh, university as a um, we were non scholarship team, uh, but that was that was awesome, and that was really my entree into coaching because my um, the guy that was coaching there my uh, my freshman year at Georgetown, Steve Wilson, was coaching a summer team in in uh, Northern Virginia suburbs, uh, and asked me if I wanted to be an assistant coach. So my first coaching gig was as an assistant coach at Vienna Aquatic Club, um, which if you're familiar with uh, the, the D.C. area teams, uh, Machine Aquatics, Dan Jacobs, that's actually where he uh, grew up as a swimmer. We, we missed each other, I think, by a year or two uh, for me having the opportunity to coach him, but uh, he still lives in that neighborhood and uh, uh, he, he swam for Vienna Aquatics. So I did that. Coached summer league, you know, kind of all through my collegiate career. Had had a, an injury my junior year and actually kind of served as a volunteer assistant um, for a while for the team. Um, and then, uh, then did a little bit of grad school, was an assistant coach for, for Georgetown, still coaching summer league and uh and then i got the opportunity to start a uh what was then uh had morphed into usa swimming got to start a club at a new uh indoor um racket and and swim facility in burke virginia and so i was the founding coach of a team called the burke barracudas and coached there um and potomac valley is a great place to uh, get a coaching start. Uh, you kind of get spoiled there, though, because um, 
there are so many uh, swimmers in that area. The, the summer league programming uh, is so extensive and really intensive. Um, a lot of kids uh, gravitate towards towards that swimming year round. So we went from uh, what was a list of 35 kids on a sheet of paper that, that were interested in being on a year round team at this, this racket club. Um, and in three years, we were up to about 215, 220 swimmers. Uh, and uh, so just really rapid growth and, and pretty rapid success. I think we were fourth or fifth in the LSC um, after three years behind the 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 larger powerhouse clubs of Curl and um, Rockville Montgomery and at that time Solitar and then uh, I got offered a a job uh, down at Mission Bay uh, in Boca Raton Florida as the head age group coach um, and I left and. Uh, the Burke Barracudas merged with Curl Swim Club and became Curl Burke, which is now known as NCAL. Um, so that's, uh, I guess I have a little piece of the, the NCAP history uh, in my credit um, and was, was fortunate to, to go down to Mission Bay, work for Mark Schubert uh, alongside Jack Roach, Larry Leibowitz, um, and then Mark left to become the women's coach at Texas after the 88 Olympics and Steve Boltman came in. So, um, go you know, from one hall of fame coach to another hall of fame coach. As so what a, I'm hearing Mark is that you just have mentor. no, no people around you that you could really kind of pick their brain. Like there was no <laughs> yeah, I was, I was really fortunate. Um, when, when I started that team in Burke, Pete Morgan was, uh, from, uh, who's now the, the head coach at NCAP was the, um, was the aquatics director and his curl senior group was practicing alongside my little fledgling team. And so I, ha I have Pete Morgan, I have Mark Schubert, I have Steve Boltman, all three Hall of Fame coaches, all have produced Olympians. And uh, those were kind of my mentors uh, growing up. And then, um, after a stint in Orlando, I went and coached in Fort Lauderdale with Jack Nelson. So of uh, four Hall of Fame coaches in my first uh, seven years of coaching to, to learn from and mentor from, not to mention uh, Larry Leibowitz and Jack Roach and, and all the other coaches that uh, were on staff at Mission Bay. Uh, just a great uh, place to grow as a young coach. And, uh, I feel very fortunate about that. Uh, didn't realize it at the time, how lucky I was, but, um, it, it really, um, I think gave me a great foundation of both what to do. And also, um, you know, a few things not to do as a coach, right? We learn, um, we learn from our experience and we learn from our mentors, both, both the positives and the negatives. So, um, anyway, I had some success in coaching, uh, ended up moving to Indiana, um, coached there for 17 years, uh, primarily, uh, for 11 of those years with the team called Washington Township Swim Club on the North side of Indianapolis. And, we were uh, able to have a lot of success there, both on the high school level and, and national level uh, competition. Had some athletes make junior teams, um, Olympic trial semifinalist, um, and um, then spent seven years in Crawfordsville, Indiana. Uh, and then in 2012, moved out here to Colorado, or 2011, moved out here to Colorado Springs and coached for a year and then got offered a position with USA Swimming in the um, sport development division as a uh, performance development manager. And so I've spent the last eight years up till the end of June this year um, working with coaches and teams around the country, providing education on how to go faster. And I can't think of a better job. Um, 
than, than that job, uh, just getting to talk swimming and think swimming all the time. Uh, and, and then to be able to share that knowledge with coaches and athletes to help them grow. Uh, so that was, was a great eight year, uh, gig. And then due to COVID and, and some other things going on, um, you know, we got offered a, uh, a situation to, uh, USA Swimming was looking to downsize a little bit. And so I got offered the, the chance to take a separation deal, uh, severance deal. And so I've spent the last two months kind of a little bit on vacation, I guess, and now starting to explore other opportunities for uh, to continue contributing um, to the sport. Don't know whether that's going to be on deck or in another, you know, kind of mentorship role. Um, but we're we're currently looking at that, and hopefully we'll we'll have a plan by the end of September of what's of what's next. Here's my plug in for any potential suitors. Uh, Mark has changed kind of my coaching career. Um, you know, I'm, I'm from Rochester, New York, and uh, I visit family probably about once or twice a year. And it just so happened that I was visiting family for a weekend and there was a coaching clinic going on down the street. And I thought two birds, one stone. My grandparents' house is kind of like the place where time stands still. I might as well make this productive and I can mark it off on my taxes. So walked onto a coaching clinic. It happened to be Mark and Scott Colby and a couple other USA swimming guys. Uh, and I mean, that, that's what today's podcast is going to kind of center around. It's just this concept of overall athleticism and, you know, how, how do some athletes excel in areas, not only because of technique, but because of how they were developed wholeheartedly. And uh, Mark Ruff, ruffled some feathers in that room, but it was something that I think everybody needed to hear. Like, I think the, the, the final word was, if you're not doing this with your athletes, you're choosing not to make them faster. And I was like, well, I don't want to do that. Um, and, you know, Mark and I have had a few interactions since then, and he's been a, a truly wonderful mentor for me. And he knows when to push my buttons and he knows, you know, how to do it the right way. So if there's any big programs, big organizations out there looking for somebody at the top, Mark's your guy. So. Um, so Mark, let's jump right into this. You know, well, thanks, Jason. I, do I need to give you a commission if uh, a yeah. finder's fee for a job? Yeah, of course. You, uh, we'll, we'll worry about that off camera. <clears throat> but yeah, we're just going to kind of talk about development. So Mark, I want you to imagine you've got a 10-year-old athlete who is new to the sport and has some promise. What is something that you as a, as a coach, as a, as a facilitator to his or her development what do you do with that kid on the land and in the water in those early years in that 10 to 14 range what what would you recommend coaches emphasize well there there's no no replacement for the fundamentals and i and i think in that um you know whether it's an eight-year-old a 10-year-old a 12-year-old they're they're still in the process of developing and learning physically and what we really want to set at that age is the proper pathways for that for their brain to fire so that they can develop great stroke technique so for me the foundation always comes back and, and you see behind me uh sorry over this shoulder coach wooden's pyramid of success and at the heart of his pyramid is the word skill um, being able to um, learn a skill, own a skill, and then deliver that skill in competition is, is really what um, coaching and athletic performance is, is all about. And if you do any kind of study on, on how the body functions and how the body learns, it's through repetition. Um, through repetition of the proper technique, really whatever we repeatedly do is what we get better at. Um, so we want to make sure we're doing the right thing. So for the, those young athletes, it's, it's honing their, um, their technique, getting them to be as efficient as possible in the water. And then the second part piece of that to me is 
to really inspire them um, to have a vision of what they can be uh, and to love the challenge of trying to figure out how to get better. Um, if we have that skill and we have that, that, that joy and that inquisitive, inquisitiveness, you know, the buzzword growth mindset, right? If we can get kids to have a growth mindset, I think there's nothing to stop them to reaching, um, you know, their highest potential. So, um, I would be doing a lot of stroke counting stuff and obviously, using drills at the youngest ages to develop that, but then having key focal points in the training for the, those 10 to 14 year olds of things to cues for them to focus on, to remind them of their, of uh, what they need to be paying attention to while they're doing a set, right? It's not just the interval it's not just how we're getting their heartbeats to work and how we're challenging them physically, but are they able to maintain that efficiency and that quality stroke technique? Because we want to make that bulletproof. So when it's time to race and they're, they then layer their physical uh, gifts onto that, they can have truly high performance. And same thing needs to happen in the dry limit. Um, and, and one of my, one of the things I, I, I think that I, I spent a lot of time, um, preaching about or sharing my opinion about as far as dry land is that we can't just be running a dry land program to try and tire kids out and challenge them physically. We have to make sure they're using their bodies in the right way. So emphasizing technique in whatever type of dry land training you're using and not allowing um, athletes to put themselves at risk for injury um, by using improper technique and really laying the foundation, right? We're not going to have, at least I would not choose to have my 10 year olds doing Olympic lifts, but they can learn the movements of squats. They can, learn the movements of clean and jerk. They can learn the proper technique for a push-up. Far better, in my opinion, for to have a kid do 10 perfect push-ups than have them do 100 push-ups where they're not maintaining their, their body line, where, where um, you know, they're really struggling. Uh, and I'll, I'll much, kind of jump on that too. Yeah, if, sure. If you don't teach your kids – Good dry land when they're 10 to 14, when they get to me in high school, they don't know how to hinge and they don't know how to squat and they think they're doing it right. So I think, Mark, that's huge. Just understanding, you know, right. don't get a 10 year old with a 45 pound bar, but maybe a PVC pipe, you know, just so that they understand what that movement feels like. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, technique is the really for me the foundation for everything that we're going to do. Because as you said, when they get, you know, after they've done four to six years of an exercise a certain way, it's really hard to reteach it. And they're not going to gain the full benefit of, uh, of an exercise, whether it's in the water or out of the water, if they're doing it with, with poor technique. And I mean, I think that concept too of neuroplasticity that a 10 year old is going to see something, process it and do it at a faster rate than an 18 year old would. And I work a lot with those first year seniors in high school that have, they just wanted to have something social. So they joined the swim team. And those are sometimes some of the hardest kids to teach technique to, but sometimes they're the easiest because they've done other sports for years and they've been exposed to a wide variety of movements. So Mark, let's, let's move forward now. So we did the 10 to 14. Sure. What would you focus on for those 14 to 18 year old kids? How would you really try to impress upon them? You know, what should they be doing in the water at this point? What should they be doing on land at this point? Well, we serve, you know, to me, we stay with, with the skill development and skill refinement, but, but this is where we can start as they're, physically maturing, laying on that increased um, physical load. 
um, for them. So focusing on getting stronger, becoming more athletic, and then learning how to transfer that into the water. Um, so, you, so you really want your dry land program and your swimming program to complement each other because there's always going to be a little bit of a lag, I think. Um, at least in my experience, there's been a little bit of lag between physical development and then being able to translate that into performance in the water because kids have to learn how to use the strength that they've gained and apply that properly to their technique. Um, so certainly increasing the, the, uh, you know, the volume of training, the intensity of training uh, that whole way through, and then, and then really starting to learn how to race. Um, you know, racing is the fun part of the sport, but it's also a very cerebral part of the sport and um, learning how to execute a race um, in a way that optimizes the athlete's skills and uses, um, you know, the right amount of energy and effort at the right time. It, to me, that's what, what we want to learn in that age 14 to 18. And it comes from doing, you know, doing quality stuff in practice. I'm not personally, um, you know, an advocate of going all USRPT, all race pace training all the time. I think there needs to be a balance or recovery from that type of work. Um, and again, that's my personal opinion as a coach. Uh, of what I think um, think is going to work best. So staying with that focus on great technique, um, always seeking to become more efficient, maximizing our efficiency underwater, maximizing how we use the walls, and then you know getting the most out of each and every stroke um, in practice. Um, to me, that, that's that's where we want to go. And and doing the same thing on land, right? Progressing. Okay, now we can start to add that load to those exercise exercises that we spent those those four years previous mastering. Right. And now we can add the load and start to build some some real strength as the athletes' bodies mature. Um, and then, and then using that strength um, more efficiently and more effectively in the water. Absolutely. And, you know, we're going to use the C word here. We're going to talk about Caleb a little bit. Uh, and that was, that was the concept that Mark had spoken about at this clinic a few years back was, you know, Caleb Dressel is a physical specimen, sure. And he has God-given genetic pieces of him that make him a fantastic athlete, but there are pieces of Caleb that were grown versus, you know, innately given. So, you know, Caleb was a phenom going into when he was 18, setting national age group records. What do you think uh, attributed to Caleb's ability to just be a, a really good athlete? Like he's one of those guys that if you saw him walk across the room, you would think he's an athlete. You may not think he's a swimmer. You know, wh what do you think contributed to his ability to be overall athletic? Well, and, and I can't, uh, I can't uh, you know, profess to know all the ins and outs of Caleb's uh, upbringing, but from, from my understanding, he grew up kind of in a, in a more rural part of Florida. Uh, parents had a farm, so he did a lot of natural strength building, farm chores, playing outside, and, and that type of thing. And I think a lot of that helped him develop uh, physically, obviously, he had some great coaches at the bowl school um, where he was a day student. So he wasn't a, a boarding student. He didn't go to bowls only, uh, you know, for swimming. He went there for academics as well. And and um, and I think was fortunate to have some coaches there that uh, in, in Sergio Lopez, um, Dale Porter, Jason Kalanok. Um, people like that who um, took the time to develop these kids uh, athletically in the right way, um, having a progressive 
uh, plan for them in terms of their training load and not trying to do everything, you know, um, right away uh, with those athletes. So Caleb was allowed to progress and grow. And, and, and I think that helped develop his joy, um, you know, for the sport. Um, there are stories about how he thought about after his senior year of, of high school of quitting and decided that he really wanted to see what he could accomplish. And I think, so he, Caleb's a swimmer by choice, right? He's an athlete by um, just kind of his upbringing and his own personal physical gifts, but he's a swimmer by choice. He probably, given, given his, you know, impressive vertical leap and things like that could have been successful in, in some other sports. And we're, we as swimmer, swim fans, swim coaches, swim people, right. We're very blessed that he chose swimming, um, as, as you know, what he wanted to do. Um, so I think in terms of the physical gifts, being in a program that took a very much a developmental approach, even when, uh, you know, those athletes were in high school and you've got Ryan Murphy, Joseph Schooling. So you've got some some very impressive swimmers, um, you know, who have been really dominant athletes over the last, you know, five to six years that came out of that program, as well as countless others, you know, that um, that have been successful at, at every level of our sport. Yeah, I think there's something um, to be said about that. Like there's this like historic picture of Caleb and Ryan Murphy and Joe Schooling and Santo Condorelli. And it's like, like you don't luck out and have four swimmers of that caliber happen to go to your school, happen to come to your club team. At some point, something that Sergio, Jason, all those guys are doing is developing this, you know, I've always kind of heard that when you get to the highest level of competition, the athleticism is the exact same across the board. There's something about those guys that get them over that, that hump of competition and, and whatever, whatever Sergio has been able to do with that program and bowl school. And I mean, going back to Greg Troy, I mean, there's something that is being instilled in these athletes that puts them above and beyond what their athletic capabilities are. Well, yeah. And, and I think, if you if you talk to Caleb or you've listened to any of the you know the podcasts he's done or if you've been fortunate enough that he's spoke to your team during the you know the the COVID shutdown earlier, um, he's a true student of the sport. He understands what he's doing, and I think that's really what sets so many of the great ones apart is their ability to understand. And if you listen to Caleb. Um, break down his races, he's very aware of what's going on from an efficiency standpoint, from a, from really what he's doing physically in the water and that awareness and that, that curiosity to understand, I think is what really has set him above and beyond, um, you know, any other athlete that's, that's really out there right now. Um, you can't replace that, right? Because he, that comes from inside him, that, that wanting to know, that wanting to learn. Obviously, he's studied a lot of video to understand where he's, uh, where he's doing things that are helping him and where he's doing things that, that, you know, are keeping him from going even faster. And I've, I just am, am so impressed with his genuine love for the sport and his genuine thirst to understand um, how to get better. Uh, and I think, um, you know, again, he's been blessed with some great coaches that I think have nurtured that and, and, um, and helped him grow in those areas. Uh, but that, that's you know, those, those are the kind of things that impress me. Yeah, the vertical jump is impressive, but you've got to figure out how you, can you translate that athleticism into um, what you're doing in the water. 
right? There are a lot of guys out there that have great vertical jumps that can't swim as fast as Caleb swimming. So um, there, there, there are other things than pure athletic talent at play. And I love what you said about Caleb loving the sport. And, you know, you have to hold me accountable to this too. I think that so many coaches count yards and, and we need to, but there's a time and place where that number does not matter. And the number of smiles coming into the building does. And the number of kids you retain every season does. And, and it's those types of things that Mark, you really try to emphasize to the coaching community. And there are some people that listen, there's some people that don't, but you know, you, you kind of called me out the other day. I said, you know, my number one focus for my kids this year is that everyone loves coming to the pool every day. And you said, why isn't that your focus every year? And I'm like, I don't have an answer to that question, but it's, it's, a, it's the truth of the matter is, you know, we foster that love, that creativity, that drive, that growth mindset by ensuring that kids aren't burning out of the sport in, in lieu of short-term success. It's those long-term success builders that, you know, and, and it might mean that this isn't going to be a 4,000 yard practice. It's going to be a 3,000 yard practice we're going to do it in a way that you love it. You got to have the kids coming back if, if for them to, to, to be able to improve. And I think that's so much a part of it. It does, doesn't mean everything's, you know, all sunshine, rainbows, and unicorns every single day. There is hard work, no doubt. Caleb works, and, and that maybe is the other thing that sets him apart. Um, from specifically the sprint type athletes is his willingness to to work beyond just uh the things that he think it is going to immediately translate into success in the 50 free he understands that there's other uh, there are other forces at play when you're racing especially if you're trying to race a broad spectrum of events um over the course of a, of a long meet, you've got to have um, physical qualities besides explosiveness and, and, um, and race savvy um, to be successful. But that comes from showing up every day. And if we can't get the kids to show up every day with a positive attitude and a thirst to get better, I think that's where we find a real challenge and we start losing kids. Um, and yeah, so, um, I just want to make sure you're always thoughtful about things like that. Right. Yeah, and, and, uh, and I know that I personally need to be made aware of those. And I mean, I'll give, I'll give everyone an example. Uh, we had an optional practice this past Friday and I could have written a normal practice, but I told my assistant coach, I'm like, you know, we've been split for the last four weeks. I want to get us the ones that choose to be there back together. I want to have some sort of set that's going to be challenging and fun and they're going to smile and we came up with this idea that we were going to do race pace 25 which everyone loves to race like you said mark but instead of seeing how fast you can go and it, it's and i was called out by one of my swimmers and he's right it's totally counterintuitive of the growth mindset concept but the whole goal of the set was you only remember your worst 25 so it's about consistency it's about consistent effort and consistent uh, results and it's not at all about the growth mindset, but that, that was kind of our gimmick. But beyond that, we did a secret word. And it was anytime somebody said the secret word or we heard a secret word get said, we got, they got to use fins for the next round. And it was like, it was totally circa Pee Wee's Playhouse. Like, you know, you said the secret word. Ah! And I mean, we had kids that loved that. And the secret was, and if many of my swimmers are listening, I don't, really don't care. You can hear it. Like there was no list of secret words. It was just any time my assistant coach or I heard a kid being overly positive or saying things that were, you know, conducive to a positive environment, he said, oh, that was a secret word. Good job. So that That's environment awesome. changed everything. And I had kids that came in miserable that mom and dad made them go to optional practice and they were pumped by the end of it. And they were going times on 25s. I was like, no, I needed your slowest one. They're like, no, that was my slowest one. I'm like, Okay. And, and it's that, it's that joy. Absolutely. So, um, so let's, let's fast forward even further now. So Kayla was a phenom going into being an 18 year old and he has only continued to be that 18 year old or continue to be that phenom since then. 
and we talked about that joy and curiosity that's driven it. But you know, what is what are those senior level athletes doing now that makes them competitive in the water and on land? How has that development continued uh, to change from their early years to their age group years and now as seniors? So I think at that senior level, it's about finding, figuring out what motivates them and what what type of challenge they're going to respond to. So as a coach, it's knowing your athletes, right? Um, and and sometimes it is um, giving them a little bit of freedom and a little bit of choice. I know Coach Troy talks about um, uh, in coaching Caleb that. Um, Sometimes they would have a workout that um, that was designed specifically maybe for the more distance oriented athletes. And he would always have an option for his sprinters to do something that was that was probably equally as challenging, but maybe not um, the same level of distance and sustained uh, effort. And uh, the interesting thing that, that Coach Troy says about Caleb is he he tends to always choose the hard option, right? He's going to choose the eight four hundred IMs over over maybe the you know three one hundreds fly on ten minutes kind of thing. Um, he tends to lean towards that that more difficult option because. I think he has goals, you know, beyond just being a great hundred flyer, right. Or a great sprinter. He wants to, wants to see what, where he can go with this. And that is part of that growth mindset. Um, you know, of, of being willing to take a risk, right. Don't pick the set that you know, you're going to succeed on pick the set or the interval that you know is going to challenge you to, to maybe give a little bit more. And I actually think that that set that you did of, of uh, I loved it when I saw it on the, uh, you posted it on Facebook, right? I love the idea of what matters is your slowest one, right? So you're not getting the kids that are taking one rep off or right, or saving up for that last one, right? They're giving, it, it gets an honest effort each time. Right, because they've got to challenge themselves. So for me, that is a growth mindset type thing. But I think it's either that's, an honest effort or a dishonest answer. And well, I, don't know, I can't guarantee I got either. But uh, you gotta, you at, well, at some point you gotta trust the kids, right? Because in the end, it's gonna show up on race day. Um, but I think that's knowing knowing your athletes, right, and being able to to figure out what challenges them and, and what they really need to get better. And I think what, what Caleb's done is um, uh, to me has, he's really blossomed in his knowledge and understanding of the sport. Uh, as I said, anytime I hear him talk, especially when I I've heard some of his, the way he's analyzed some of his races and the things that he picks out, um, to work on and the things that he notices, uh, his awareness in the water and his ability to to then see that on video and and link the two together is something that he's really developed. And I think the the coaching staff at Florida and with Gator Swim Club deserve a lot of credit for that. Um, I know um, I think it's Steve Youngbluth who who. Um, did a lot of the sprint coaching um, for Coach Troy. And I, I, I'm not sure if he's still at Florida or not, but I know I've watched him sit at our video review booth um, and watch Caleb's races over and over and over again, looking for that little piece of why wasn't it, you know, why was it a, a 22.7 instead of a 22.4? you know, in that 50 free and where, where are we losing those three tenths of a second and, and how can we, how can we get better? Um, so I think it's searching for those, those smaller improvements as the athletes get older and, and seizing the opportunities um, that are out there. Um, and that's something that I think um, they've been able to do as well as, as anybody else, the, the team of coaches that's worked with Caleb and, 
and Caleb himself. Um, uh, and that's, again, observing from afar, um, listening to Caleb talk, uh, having heard his coaches talk about, about what makes Caleb special. And, and that's really uh, what I see as the, as the biggest difference and, and really some, some ways that, that we as coaches can start to listen to our athletes a little bit more and give them a little bit more, uh, I don't want to necessarily say freedom, but a little more input into what they're doing. And I think that can happen, uh, you know, that can even happen when you're coaching eight-year-olds, right? Now, you're not going to let the eight-year-olds dictate everything that happens, but you you can get their input. And, and they start to understand then that you value what they know about their swimming. And they're going to seek to have more knowledge, right? And the same thing at 12, you know, they get this, this certain amount of, of freedom or input or um, responsibility laid on them. So, and then it, and then it progresses up through there. Um, There's this concept of education of self-discovery being the greatest form of education. And there's, there are people that theorize with, uh, you know, a lot of learning going digital where kids have, are a little bit on their own, you're going to see a divide. You're going to see some kids take the easy way out and Google everything. And then you're going to see some kids that are really thirsty for knowledge and thirsty to understand. And their depth of knowledge is going to be greater than even if they were in a classroom. And, and it's theories, but absolutely. I, I agree 100%. If we get that, the kids to, if we trick the kids into being curious, you know, that that's, that's outstanding. Well, Mark, you know, a year and a half, two years ago, whenever it was, when I went to that conference, uh, the the specific topic was all about Caleb, well, not Caleb start, but a, a pole start, which Caleb mm-hmm. has perfected over the years. And I think you're going to show us a few videos just kind of about what has made it so effective and, you know, kind of that history on my coaching career. I did, unfortunately, in year two or three, uh, I, I had a swimmer break her neck doing a uh, – doing a pole start. So I kind of wrote it off. And then I went to your conference and I was like, all right, uh, like I've got to put this back on the table and give those kids the input to say, you can do it this way or this way. Um, So let's go ahead and take a look at some of those videos. If you are listening on a podcast platform, you can watch this on YouTube. It will be available at the website bit.ly slash O-T-T Hesse. That's O-T-T-H-E-S-S-E. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up some videos here. Um, I have to give credit to John Nelson of the York YMCA, who spent some time down a few years ago visiting with uh, Caleb and Coach Troy and observing what uh, what they were doing down there. and And he shared these videos with me. So we'll we'll take a look at these. Um, they're slow motion. I'm hoping they they uh, they come through. Um, they come through well on the uh, uh, on the screen here. So I'm gonna share this. All right, and just play it through. It's a couple different uh, views of Caleb's track start. One kind of head on looking at it, and this one from above. And one of the interesting things that Coach Troy has said about Caleb, and a direct quote um, um, from Caleb via Coach Troy, is that he, Caleb, uses his arms as much as he uses his legs on the start. And um, he's made that a real point that he's pulling as hard with his arms as he is pushing with the with his legs. And I, I love you see the the great entry. People talk about the over um, kind of the overhead recovery of his um, of his arms. I don't know that that's what makes his start special. 
Um, there's a device called a 4D Pro, which is kind of like a TRX uh, on, uh, on steroids. Um, we'll show, uh, let's take a look at this. This is his start and all the way through the breakout. And you can see that clean breakout that Caleb has. But this 4D Pro, um, kind of TRX with bungee cords. Um, and it was something that uh, they used a lot at the bowl school. And when they would actually practice launching themselves off the deck up into the air, mimicking a start. And I think that's where Caleb picked up that overarm recovery. But what we see here, um, let me back it up to right. Sorry, back it up just a little bit. And what you see right here as Caleb takes his mark is what I call the loading of his arms. And you can see the arms kind of bend inward. And that's what sets Caleb up to be able to launch with his arms as much of his as his legs. So the arms are are preloaded and a lot of young athletes I think we see them load their arms by leaning back on the block and that creates the tension in the arms what we see with Caleb here is that he is loading the arms um, through the internal movement of kind of gripping the block uh, inward rotation of the elbows uh, almost like he's trying to bend the front of a block of the block. I've had some strength and conditioning coaches uh, talk to me, and weightlifting coaches talk. They talk about lifters trying to bend the bar to engage their arms before they execute a lift, and I think um, that that's what we see Caleb doing here. We'll back it up a little bit and and just play it through again. There you see that loading of the arms and then the explosion um, off of that. See, I've got some other videos here we can uh, pull up if I can get my screen to work right. Um, We go up here to all right. And we can see in this video, I kind of spot shadowed Caleb. This is from Olympic trials in 16. And again, you saw that loading of the arms. And actually, in this race, uh, he kind of blows his breakout. Uh, and for me, that's um, that's one of the things that I think as coaches, we tend to um, uh, neglect when we are working on starts, right? The kids just do the start and then they don't really execute the rest of the beginning of the race in practice. They may just do the start and then kind of float up or something like that. I think you always want to be practicing um all the way through the completion of that skill, which is through um, the breakout. But as we, um, you know, as we go through this video, and you, you watch here in the spot shadow, he's going to get that that bend and that load in the arms, right, uh, right there explosion off the blocks, but then you watch up here, watch the breakout, his head pops up and it's almost like he stops in the water before swimming. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, that's something we can, we can all, 
work on with the athletes is that smooth transition from the underwater dolphin to the swim. And, and Caleb's obviously improved this significantly. Um, and that may just be, an in, in, you know, that one race, uh, that little mistake, it ended up costing him uh, and he ended up in third. Uh, I mean, even Mark, when you look at this, like you don't see Caleb do a race anymore where he's not a half body length ahead at the start. Right. And I mean, since t this 2016 video, it seems like he's identified that, like, I need to have my get out speed be my strength. And I, I mean, you see him kind of come back on him towards the end of that first length. And then the second length, he does the weirdest thing I've ever seen. He, he'll accelerate to the finish, but that's a whole different story. But you see him pop out. And in this video, you don't see him pop out. It, it, it's interesting. Right. So a little younger, a little less experienced, maybe a little less thoughtful about those fine details. Um, to me, you know, the, the places that we're going to, uh, I've always felt like in a swim race, and the 50 is the, the epitome of this, it's a swimmer that slows down the least that's going to win that race. And oftentimes we watch a race and we see somebody pull away at the end. It's not that they're accelerating most of the time. It's just that they're not slowing down, whereas everybody else in the race is slowing down. And I think the biggest place we, we lose those or we can, can leak that speed is in those transitions. So the transition from the block to the air, right? If you're not using your arms, you're going to be slower and leave the block with less velocity than somebody who is using their arms and legs equally. Then we've got the transition, the entry into the water. We want to make that as clean as possible, right? We want to have that, um, that perfect pencil-like entry. And then we've got a transition from being in the air or being entering the water to adding the dolphin kick, right? And how do we make that not a separate entity? And then the transition of going from the underwater dolphin into the swimming. Um, and let me go back and, um, and pull up uh, some other, other video here. We go with the, I'll go with the 4D Pro, uh, show people what that kind of looks like. This is some video I shot at the bowl school. Um, and you can see these athletes taking off here, just working on that kind of flying through the air, maintaining that body line. Now, each of these units, I think, is is three to four hundred dollars if you try and, and order them. Now, obviously, uh, you know, huge advantage for the for the uh, or nice for the bowl school to be able to have the finances to be able to afford that. But you see some of the guys doing the overarm um, recovery, and I think this may be where pay, Caleb picked that up on his start. I actually uh, had the chance after the kids were done to uh, uh, to try this myself, uh, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, and I didn't really feel the 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 value of the dry land portion of it uh, until um, until the next day, and my whole body was sore after doing it because it really, you have to engage your entire core. All right, let me search for that other video about the transitions, Jason. Uh, uh, here we got another video put together by, uh, by John Nelson looking at the transition from underwater dolphin into swimming. And you see uh, in this, you've got some video of both Michael Phelps and of Caleb, and they dolphin through that first cycle 
of swimming. And I think uh, Michael was the first one uh, that I saw use this. And then it, uh, Lochte started using it after I think he probably noticed that Michael was doing it, or maybe maybe the two did a little collaboration and, and discussion about that breakout. And then, and now you see next gen Caleb doing it. And again, it's trying to minimize that leaking of speed through the transition of, uh, you know, from underwater to flutter kicking to adding the arms into it. So by dolphining through that first cycle, right, they're able to, to not have that hesitation. And I think that's probably the best one we saw right there. There's no pause and no kind of upward, uh, upward movement of the body. It's a forward movement into the swimmer. Um, you know, Mark, you showed this at that conference those years ago. The season following, we started doing this. I'd been chasing a boys 200 free relay record for about five years. And I mean, all four of those boys wound up being division one recruits. And we started doing this breakout. And I mean, we went from just missing that relay record for about three years to beating it by two seconds on. And oh, wow. Of the That's four, awesome. And, and it was. But of the four kids that broke that record, one of them had an opportunity to swim in college. The other three had never thought about it before that season. Like, it, it was one of those things. They were all boys that were like 23s in the 53. But it was that little piece that they were like, this makes sense because I don't feel that water hit me when I break out. It, it, was a, it was a game changer for my program this past year. So, yeah, it's, a, it's that attention to detail, you know, and I think, again, that's one of those things that sets Caleb apart. Now, how much that's him and how much he's learned that from his, his wonderful coaches that he's had, um, you know, I, you'd have to ask him the answer to that question. But to me, um, these are the kind of things that that uh, with the senior level athletes are going to make a huge difference. Now, do you need to to teach this to your eight year olds, your 10 year olds, your 12 year olds? I think you can start at that level. They're not going to be able to perfect it, but you want to talk to them about um, the concept of always moving forward. I mean, to me, swimming is really simple, right? Keep moving forward. You're going to be faster. Do things that move you forward. Stay away from the things that don't allow you to move forward, and you're going to be successful. So that, to me, that's the streamlining, the you know, correct body position. All you know, anytime we we anytime the tiles on the bottom of the pool slow down, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> Right. So I, I think that's the way to think about it. Um, hey, Mark, we're going to have to wrap it up here in just a minute. Yeah. But, you know, I like to always th this podcast was inspired by COVID and trying to encourage coaches to. This was my creative outlet, like I needed a way to keep plugged in and talk with coaches and communicate. And, you know, I, I always kind of want to bring it back to this. And my last question for every guest is what advice would you give to coaches athletes and families as we move forward either into or out of this pandemic great question um and to me the key is cooperation and collaboration and having that community um priority that community feel to it um within a within a team right each of each of us within uh, a swim team or a practice group, we have a responsibility to every other person in that practice group, um, really every day to help them get better. But especially in this time, right, to make sure we're doing the right things away from practice so that we don't bring the virus into the practice environment and and increase the chances of us not being able to train. And I think more globally, right, the way for our sport to survive 
And whether that's a club team, a high school team, or we start, we're starting to see these collegiate teams, you know, be cut or, or cease to exist. The, the way for us to move forward is through that cooperation and collaboration and supporting each other. And then within, um, you know, I'll speak specifically in the coaching community, those areas that have come through um, COVID the, the strongest to me are the ones where the coaches have been communicating, sharing ideas, maybe even sharing cool space, right? Or if you've got the ability to run a meet, inviting that neighboring team to come and, uh, you know, be a part of, of your meet if you're able to do that with social distancing rather than saying, you know, ha, 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 we've got a pool, we can have a meet, you can, right? And using that as kind of a marketing tool, right? We're going to get better and we're going to come out of this stronger because everybody comes out of it stronger, not because we have uh, coaches or organizations kind of hoarding resources. We, we really need to support each other. And, and so that's my, I guess it's the three C's, cooperation, collaboration, and community. Um, uh, whether it's whether it's in your local uh, area with your high school team, or it's more globally within your LSC, within your state, within um, the entire community of swimming in the U.S. and worldwide. Perfect, Mark. Thank you so much as always. I mean, you just do wonderful things for coaches all over the place, and I'm looking forward to seeing where Mark Hesse is 12 months from now. So uh, you're going to be having a big impact on kids in some capacity, either directly or via their coaches. So I appreciate you taking the time, Mark, and I'll see you guys next time.